Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to present to you the decision of the German Constitutional Court on uh, the Lisbon Treaty, and I will try to present the decision and some uh, thoughts about it, some observations on it. Um, since the German Constitutional Court decided its Lisbon case on June 30th um, of this year, history has not stopped, of course. There was the Irish referendum, there have been ratifications in Poland and the Czech Republic, and finally, the Lisbon Treaty came into force last Tuesday, December 1st. Um, and to a certain extent, the eternal story of the ratification of a new comprehensive treaty has now come to an end. Uh, the legal, legal and political debates surrounding it have lost now a little bit of the urgent character they had had for many years. And it seems unlikely that there will be another huge treaty reform for many years to come. However, the tortuous history of the coming into force of the Lisbon Treaty, the rejection of, of reform treaties in several referenda, the passionate debates on the tasks of the European Union, uh, the tasks the European Union should or should not fulfill, have shown a profound uneasiness of the European nations as to the European Union. And this skepticism, to a certain extent, has now even reached the German Federal Constitutional Court. And in a certain sense, you might think that the German way of doing a referendum is putting a question to the Constitutional Court. Um, this decision on the Lisbon Treaty can be read as the reformulation of this uneasiness in the language of German constitutional law. And I will try to briefly resume the argument of the court and then present to you some observations on the judgment on what it means or what it reveals. So what did the court say? As you know, the court found that the Lisbon Treaty complies with the requirements of German constitutional law. Yet at the same time, the judgment contains important qualifications, reservations, that restrict the extent of this approval. It is, uh, one could say, a decision of yes, but, and the but is even stronger than the yes to a certain extent. The treaty complies with the German basic law, but only in the restrictive interpretation given to it by the court. The main thrust of the decision, then, is an explication of the absolute limits German constitutional law, at least in the interpretation of the court, poses to the further development of the European Union. In this sense, the judgment is not primarily a decision on the Lisbon Treaty. It is a decision that tries to flesh out the constitutional limits to any further deepening of the European integration, either under the Lisbon Treaty or with future treaty reforms. And fundamentally, the court says to the integration process, stop here. To this purpose, it threatens to review European legislation if the Union transgresses the boundaries of its jurisdiction in an obvious way. The court had already threatened to do so in its famous Maastricht decision in 1993. But it has never actually put that threat into practice and actually invalidated a European regulation or directive. So it now repeats the threat, and to a certain extent it even strengthens the threat because it claims that there is a German constitutional identity which might be violated even by EU secondary legislation. But that's not the only uh, interesting aspect about this case, because this would just be a confirmation of the Maastricht threats. But the court goes, very, uh, uh, goes further. It affirms that the German constitution poses absolute limits to any further transfer of powers to the European Union. Even if, and this is required by the basic law, the treaty reform is approved by two-third majorities of the two chambers of the German parliament. So even in this case, the transfer is limited. The court derives those limits from the so-called eternity clause of the constitution, a very German invention, the eternity clause, 
Under this provision, a constitutional amendment to the German constitution that violates core principles of human dignity or democratic rule is prohibited, prohibited even to the constitutional amendment process. And the court now wants to derive from that clause a long list of reserved powers which cannot be transferred, transferred to the European Union even by those two-third majorities. And this list includes, among others, as the court says, citizenship, the civil and military use of force, tax powers, language, family, education, and religion. And there are still some others. The court also affirms that the basic law prevents Germany from participating in the founding of a European federal state. It had never said that in the past. In, in the master's decision, it had explicitly left open this question. Now, according to the court, such a transition to a federal statehood could not take place under the basic law. It would require an intervention of the people as the constituent, constituent power. So a new German constitution adopted by the people would be necessary for this step. The main argument of the court for this affirmation is a ringing indictment of the European Union with respect to democracy. The court claims that the EU suffers from a democratic deficit that could only be cured by the transition to a federal state. But this is prohibited by the German constitution. So it could be cured, but not under this constitution. This argument about the democratic deficit is centered on the position of the European Parliament. The court bemoans the lack of electoral equality, as the European Parliament still consists of member state contingents of seats, as it had always been and as it is still under the Lisbon Treaty. Certainly, those contingents, now from 6 to 96, take into account the different population sizes. But the weight of the vote of a citizen from a small member state may still be about 12 times the weight of the vote of a citizen from a big member state. According to the court, this lack of electoral equality would never be accepted inside the member states. The court always says, in states you would never accept this, we can only accept it in something special in the European Union. The court goes on to affirm that democracy in states implies majoritarian parliamentary government and a clear-cut competition between government and opposition. Competition which is widely absent from the European Parliament, of course. Under these circumstances, for the court, democracy requires that decisions in important areas of life remain at the level of the member states. They are full democracies. The European Union is not. Further transfers of powers to the European Union would require a prior transition to a federal state. Then the problems would be solved. There would be a unified European people and a majoritarian European parliamentary government. But this is not yet the case. And as it is not yet the case, further transfers of power cannot occur, according to the court. And this transition, as I mentioned earlier, is prohibited by the basic law in the interpretation of the court and would require a new German constitution. Those are, simply put, the basic lines of argument of the court in this very, very long opinion. Now we'd like to make some observations and remarks on the court's perspective. In, in my judgment, the argument of the court is not very convincing. I think that the standard of democratic government that the court affirms for states is an idealized model. And this model is based on the parliamentary government of Westminster, to a certain extent. But many parliamentary systems do not work that way across Europe. There is often proportional representation there are complicated coalition governments. There are even minority governments in the Scandinavian cases. 
So across continental Europe, the Westminster model of the competition between government and opposition is not the only way to uh, rule parliamentary government. But this is not the only problem with the court's perspective. The other problem is that uh, its perspective is completely unconvincing for federal states. Old federal democracies like Switzerland or the United States do not function according to the Westminster model. There is no parliamentary government in Switzerland or in the US. They do not have, they do not have majoritarian parliamentary government. And their federal chambers, like the American Senate, do not respect strict electoral equality because the citizens from smaller states are obviously overrepresented. Think of the senators from Vermont and the two senators from California. There are two senators for small states and for big states. This is not electoral equality in the sense of Karlsruhe. So the United States suffers from a democracy deficit. The standard of democratic legitimacy of the court, then, is not as universal as it claims. Many democratic states do not have democracies corresponding to this standard. And there is even a supreme irony there, because even in Germany, this standard could not really apply. Because we have, as a federal state, a federal council of states, the Bundesrat, a very important institution, um, with extensive powers in legislative matters. And in our federal council, the citizens from small states, like the tiny Saarland, where I come from, are clearly overrepresented uh, uh, if you compare it with the citizens from bigger states like Bavaria or Northern Westphalia. So even inside Germany, the standard of the court is not really applicable. It's also strange in my perspective that the highest court of the most important member state in the Union should be so blind with respect to the interests of smaller states within the European Union. Can you imagine the Supreme Court of Luxembourg or of Malta uh, uh, developing this kind of argument? Why should it not be legitimate to give members of parliament coming from smaller states of the Union a somewhat stronger voice in the European Parliament then would be justified by their population size alone. That's a legitimate concern, and it's not undemocratic as such. So I think this is a general problem of all federal systems. It's not a singularity of the European Union. It has to be dealt with even in federal states, Why the German Constitutional Court claims that such problems could never arise in states. They could only arise in so strange objects like the European Union. I think that is simply false. So what are the consequences of this, of this decision? Where do we go from there? I think by this decision, the German Constitutional Court gives up, in a certain sense, any ambition to shape the European integration. It withdraws into a purely defensive position. The judgment lacks a prospective dimension. In the past, things had been different. The court had challenged the European Union on specific matters, for example, fundamental rights. And it had helped in that way to foster the emergence of a human rights jurisprudence by the European Court of Justice. So this, in a certain sense, was constructive opposition. While now there is no longer a constructive opposition, in the Lisbon case, the court does no longer show this kind of constructive criticism anymore. Its agenda consists only in limiting and controlling the European Union like a foreign mistrusted entity. Now you may ask, will the court actually find the courage to rule against EU legislation in certain cases as it threatens in the decision? Or will it even censure future treaty revisions adopted by two-third majorities of the German legislative cham chambers? I would doubt that very much in both cases. You may say dogs who bark do not bite, and this dog barks, barks too much, and you would rather prefer it to act. I would rather think that uh, the court wants to create a certain climate where the EU institutions and protagonists will sometimes be deterred 
from construing their jurisdiction in an extensive way. And there, of course, Karlsruhe thinks of the European Court of Justice. Though I don't, so I don't think they will actually use this threat, but they use this threat to create this climate where maybe the European Court of Justice, in certain cases, will think we should better act in, an, in another way um, uh, uh, to, to help Karlsruhe stay out of the way. I think that would be the, the most obvious interpretation of what they want to achieve. In any case, there is a remarkable contrast between the attitudes of the German political elites, largely favorable to the European integration, and the attitudes of the court. In other member states, there are openly Eurosceptic parties, while in Germany, all parties are in favor of the European integration. But in the German population, there are Eurosceptic tendencies, of course. But they are not represented in the political system, or rarely politicians tend to take up this issue. In this situation, the court seems to step in as a kind of opposition by default. It's our Eurosceptic opposition, the Constitutional Court. In my view, it would be preferable for us to have a more passionate political debate including the Eurosceptic voices in Germany, and at the same time, less activist judges. I would prefer passionate politicians and not passionate judges. The problem of democratic legitimacy in the European Union, of, of course, deser deserves a huge debate. And it is still um, uh, a debate whether a system without a, an established European public opinion and all these debates, whether this can function and how it can function. But I doubt that the German Constitutional Court has contributed convincing arguments to this debate. Thank you. <laughs>